Lord Bishop, fellow clergy, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and joy and honor for me to be here today. I was told in the beginning that they expected about 2,000. I understand the count now is somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000. And that this... I prepared a message for only 2,000. <laughs> now, I was in Birmingham many years ago in the town hall for a crusade in 1947. And Cliff Barrows was with me and his wife played the piano. My wife sat there and prayed for us. And uh, I remember the wonderful time we had here and the many friends that we made here. And I've always wanted to come back. But I'd like to take as our text today from the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, a very familiar passage, but I think a very relevant passage for us today, beginning at verse 35. The fourth chapter of John's Gospel. Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already under harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. And both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you're entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. For the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode with them two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, Mission England is being held against a dark background of world crisis. A well-known newspaper reporter summed it up the other day. He said, we're living in a night of total crisis. God is dethroned from his central place in the universe. Whole nations are dispossessed to walk directionless upon the cold crust of a cold earth. The crime rate. We see crime in every newspaper we open or on the television the family breakup, the divorce rate, the moral permissiveness, and the possibility of revolution and revolt is almost everywhere. This campaign is going to be held also with the backdrop of economic problems. I'm much conscious and much concerned and much burdened about the unemployed, not only in this country, but my own country. You go to Michigan and Ohio, and western Pennsylvania and you find a situation very much like you face in the northern part of England and in the Midlands where so many people are unemployed. Three decades ago Winston Churchill said our problems are beyond us. Our greatest brains today are working on the problems of the world and they come up without an answer. There seems to be no solution and as I look upon the vast masses of this country and think of Mission England my own attitude is this. I say, who is sufficient for all of these things? I come in May with my team in fear and trembling, as the Apostle Paul did at Corinth. I come rededicating my life afresh and anew to the Lord Jesus Christ and the ministry of the gospel. I come with a sense of expectancy that God is going to do great and mighty things beyond which we could not even dream of today. I come with faith in the promises of God. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I accept that and believe that as a promise for us now. First, I would like to mention pre-evangelism, which has been going on in this country for a long time. The knowledge of the gospel is not so well known as it was 30 years ago when we held our crusades in London, or 20 years ago when we held our crusades at the Earl's Court 
in London or Wembley. I've heard British clergy say that Britain could be considered almost pagan. Yet in the midst of it all, there's been the constant witness of the church and the witness of thousands of individuals. And I'm hearing of Bible studies and prayer groups all over this country that God has raised up. Last year, we went Blackpool. And I remember that I thought to myself, of all the cities that I'd heard about in Britain, that was the last place that I expected God could do anything. And uh, now I had never been there. I shouldn't have judged it that way, but I just read about it. And I thought of it as sort of a Las Vegas of Great Britain. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went there, and I remember that for two nights, I believe it was, we held meetings, and we had several auditoriums jammed to capacity. And when I asked the people to respond to receive Christ, scores of people each night came to know the Lord. And I saw that God could work in Blackpool. And one of the ministers there said, if God can work here, he can work anywhere. And then I've been reading about the response to the preaching of a Latin evangelist around London, Luis Palau. And God has been using him as he circled London. And we will be praying for the mission to London this coming year. There's also an evidence of an increase in spiritual interest in the last five years, I'm told. And I'm finding here an expectancy. Many clergy will say to us, if no public meetings have ever been held, just the expectancy in the training has been more than worthwhile. Also, worldwide prayer. Prayer is being organized throughout the United States, in many parts of Africa and Asia and Latin America for the Mission England this coming summer. We believe we're going to be backed by a host of prayer warriors praying in many languages. And I believe that God is going to hear their prayers and we're going to see great and mighty things happen in this country. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask every one of you to write letters. Suppose every person here would write 10 letters to people you know in other parts of the world and ask them to pray and ask them to write letters to their friends. Have it announced in their churches announced on some radio or television program in some parts of the world where it's open to them. We could have a great worldwide prayer support for Mission England. We've also seen an efficient organization in our pre-evangelism. The federal committee, the regional committees, the training of counselors, the publicity that is going to go out and has already gone out so much more than we anticipated already, the interest in the public press. But I'm going to tell you something that I've learned in all these years. I've learned that publicity alone does not bring people to the meetings. The publicity arouses their curiosity so that when you go and ask them to come, they are more likely to come. But most of the people that come to our crusades and find Christ, that is the non-church people, the non-Christian people that come to our meetings are brought now, we call that Operation Andrew, and we, we got it from you. We learned it in Britain in 1954. It was being practiced in London. We took it back to America, and we've taken it all over the world to organize coaches and trains or whatever and bring the non-Christian with you to get your church. For example, let's say you have a coach, and it seats 50 people. Get 25 of your people on the coach to bring people that they know that are outside of Christ and bring them on the coach with them so that they have counseling on the way back as well as the pre-evangelism on the way. There are thousands of people that will come if you invite them. I could tell you story after story after story of some of the greatest Christian leaders in the world today that were brought to an evangelistic meeting like that by someone else that never dreamed that they were going to come and be a great leader. Now, all the elements of successful evangelism seem to me to be present in the preparation of Mission England. The harvest is white. The instruments provided by modern technology are sharper. And because of spiritual hunger, the urgency is greater. You are beginning to see for yourselves that this is not a Billy Graham affair. It's all of us working together a team of people working for three years 
a year of preparation, the year of the public meetings, and then the year of the follow-up in the churches. Now, secondly, the objective of the evangelism we're about to undertake. There was a friend of mine that ministered in this town for many years. His name was Brian Green. The first time I ever heard of Brian Green, I was a student and he was holding meetings in New York at St. John the Divine. And uh, it made the news across the country. It was at a time when evangelism was at a low ebb in the United States. But he ministered here in Birmingham for a number of years. And he has called evangelism in its broader and narrow sense. In the broader sense, first, it's an area talking religion. The press, the television, the ads, your work is going to cause an entire area of people to talk religion. Some may talk against it. Some may talk for it. Some may be neutral, but whatever. It'll be good to have people discussing religion once again so that you can go into a store or you can go in the marketplace and discuss religious things without embarrassment. Point three, evangelism in the narrowest sense. I've been talking about evangelism now in the broad sense. What is the narrow sense of evangelism? First, the primary objective is the conversion of sinners to Christ. That is our evangelism, to bring people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Archbishop's Committee of Inquiry of the Evangelistic Work of the Church in 1918 gave one of the finest definitions of evangelism I've ever read, and it, you are well acquainted with it. To evangelize is so to present Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit that men shall come to put their trust in God through him and to accept him as their savior and serve him as their king in the fellowship of his church. Brian Green said, in the narrow sense in which we're considering evangelism, it is not an attempt to improve moral standards and personal conduct. It is not a convincing of men about the truth of the gospel so that they shall give only intellectual assent. It is not the formation of church-going habits or the promotion of more frequent attendance at Holy Communion. It is not the creation of an emotional impression it is not setting the teachings of Christ over against modern society and its problems. These activities are rightly the activities of the Christian church and a part of our witness. They're indeed a part of declaring the gospel, but they're not evangelism in the narrow sense. Evangelism in the narrow sense is leading people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also adding of new people to the church. In Acts, the second chapter, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. New people should be coming into the church. But is the church ready to receive them? Are our churches ready to receive them? There's a little slogan that they have. Is your church worth joining? I think it's a good one. I think that about my own church. I'm going to close now, but I want to say that I'm going to call upon people all over the world to pray. And with your help, and with God's blessing, I believe we can see England touched for Christ this summer. I believe we can see a new sense of moral values. We can see a turnaround in the country, and this could affect the world, because whether you like it or not, England is still looked upon by the rest of the world for moral leadership. Your history is so great we look to you for so many things. And if people around the world would hear that there's a spiritual awakening going on in England, it could touch the world. And it would have an impact on the great issues of our day that are causing bewilderment in Moscow and Washington and London and other great capitals of the world. It would have an impact on your family your community, your city. I want you to know that I will come here on my knees as your servant, not as a great preacher or great evangelist, but as a servant in Christ's name to serve you, to join hands with you, and to give our very best for the sake of the gospel. Shall we pray?